Such perfection in your touch for your creations are divine. A universe of endless mystery. Oh, when I contemplate your genius, it just draws me to my knees. the Lord. Good to see you in God's house today. Thank, welcome to the South Asheville Church of God, those watching online and those here in the service. We're grateful to be here and thankful to see each of your faces. Um, we just love the Lord. Amen. Thankful to be in his house today. Let's all stand and go to the Lord in prayer together. I know there's many with special uh, needs today. We need to pray for all those that are sick and going through battles and trials today, but we serve a big God has big answers and big plans for us. Let's call him together and ask for his help on uh, the Sunday school portion and all the, the um, service as a whole. 
Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to be in your house. We thank you so much, Lord, for your Jesus care and your love, Lord Jesus, your mercy, God. to come receive our penny march and then immediately following that we'll receive our Sunday school offering. you can take charge of your classes uh, those of you in the adult class you know where we're going because you have your book your quarterly Deuteronomy chapter 4 I covet your prayers this is um, a transition for me so this lesson's going to be kind of disjointed from what's in your book as I learn to uh, <laughs> go along with the book the Lord's going to help us um, I don't really apologize for it. It's just the way it's going to happen today. The Lord direct what we're going to do, and we'll get there. Uh, the Lord's help. Amen? All right. We'll read together um, Deuteronomy 4. We'll just go ahead and read all of our verses, and then we'll jump in, okay? Deuteronomy 4, chapter 4, verse 1. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Bel Peor, for all the men that followed Bel Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. Verse 4 being at the top, those of you that have your uh, quarterly is the golden text. The verse 4 is, but ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive, every one of you, this day. That's what I want to do. Don't you cleave unto the Lord? 
Verse 5, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that ye should do so in the land whither you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh to them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. Now we'll be using some of the things that you have in your quarterly, but again we will be using uh, some other things that the Lord helped me put together. The first portion of chapter 4 of the book of Deuteronomy is our focus today as we begin this quarterly uh, Sunday school lessons. I am thrilled to be given the opportunity to teach each week as our other teachers uh, take on other duties and also continue in their positions that they currently have. It will be an adjustment for me, I've already said that, um, but we're going to get there. Uh, we're going to cover some in the book and some of the other things that I have. The title Deuteronomy means second law. The book consists of Moses' farewell messages in which he reviews and renewed God's covenant with Israel for the sake of the new generation of Israelites. They have now come to the end of their wilderness wanderings. For the most part, this new generation had no personal memory of the first Passover in Egypt, nor of the Red Sea crossing or the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. Unlike, now these are notes from the uh, Life in the Spirit Bible. It says, unlike the book of Numbers, which records the wilderness wanderings of the Exodus generation of Israelites over a span of 39 years. Now, Numbers, the, the book before this, covers a span of 39 years. But when we get to Deuteronomy, we're covering, uh, covering about a month's time. Beginning to end, Deuteronomy is just about a month's time. So we are literally looking at the 30 days out, they're going to be going into Canaan. 39, 40 years have, have passed. We are now 30 days into the final moments before they make their way into Canaan. Um, think about it this way. As we read these words and as you read these words in the future in De Deuteronomy, the crossing of the Jordan River is just one month away. The destruction of Jericho, only weeks down the road from these statements. The conquest of Canaan is at their fingertips, but so also in that same short amount of time is going to be the death of their beloved one of a kind, one of a kind, Moses, right? The drawn out, burning bush seer, holy ground walker, staff carrying, Pharaoh fighting, plague announcing, message getter, commandment deliverer, veil wearing leader, Moses. They're about to lose him. They know his death is imminent. He knows his own death. He has been told that he cannot go into Canaan. So during these last days of his life, he is pushing into these people what they need to know, right? He knows that his time is short, and he knows this is a new generation that haven't, haven't heard his words for many years. Some of them have not heard his words very many years at all. And so they are, I hope, drinking in what he's saying, but he has this this compelling in his life, I'm sure. He knows his time is short. Put all in them that you can. Last words, final words. Now, this is something I wanted to share too, real quickly. The words of a dying man or dying woman are very, very significant. By the time these words are being spoken, much of what has mattered in life does not matter anymore. As an earthly life comes to a close, only eternal things really matter, and a person's last words often get right to the most important issues of life, and they often reveal the condition of the heart and soul of the person who utters them. How many of you have been present when a loved one or a friend has passed away? Been present with someone? How many of you have heard their last words? Been there? There's just something about hearing the voice of your loved one and what their thoughts are just before they cross over into eternity. I can remember all of us gathered around the bedside of, of Grandpa Shelton, Pastor Shelton then, um, and I can remember his dying words where he was saying, I love you to Granny. 
could see his mouth moving and what he was saying to her. It was beautiful. I wanted to share this too. The last word spoken by Kenny Morris's grandmother. Some of you probably heard this in one of his messages, but I thought it was so amazing. His grandmother was a dear saint of, of God. She lived her life for the Lord. And in her final moments of life, she had kind of drifted away, not speaking for some time. And one of her sons managed to wrap his arms around her and hold her as she was dying. And that would be Brother Morris's uncle. And he said that after some time had passed, all of a sudden her eyes opened. And she said clearly, open up them gates. And she was gone. How amazing is that? There are many triumphant final words recorded in Scripture as well. What about Stephen in Acts 7, 54 through 60? The Bible says he looked steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God in his final moments. He even was able to see inside heaven so clearly he could see Jesus standing, not seated at the right hand of God. In his final earthly moments, he spoke out loud what he was witnessing on the other side. And the Bible says that the crowd that hated him so much, they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears at that. Can you imagine? People do that even now. Stopped their ears at hearing that he could see Jesus in heaven. My goodness. They stopped their ears and ran at him. They hated him. They cast him out of the city and they stoned him to death. His last words being, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. What amazing last words. The thief on the cross, Luke 23 and 42, having arrived on the pages of God's word, a lost and undone criminal with only hours to live, leaves behind a legacy of hope for future last moment conversions with his last words. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And we all know his words were met with an eternity's worth of mercy. The final words of David are recorded in 1 Kings 2, speaking to his son Solomon. He gave clear instruction on how to deal with certain situations and with his own life with statements like, Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. This is David in his last moments to Solomon. Keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and keep his statutes and commandments. And the patriarch Jacob was set up in Hebrews 11, 21, by faith Jacob when he was a dying blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. His dying words were also for the next generation, much like David's were. Jacob's were to the next generation coming up behind him. They were forceful and without partiality straight from his heart. The words of Samson, his last moments uh, in Judges 16, towards the end, only this once, remember? Only this once, O oh God, let me have vengeance upon my enemy. And finally, what about the final words of Jesus? Scattered throughout the Gospels, he made seven recorded statements while he was dying on the cross, each statement having its own unique significance, each one worthy of an entire lesson individually. From the first one, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. To the last, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Last words spoken are not always related to good things. Consider the last words spoken by King Saul as he lay wounded from a battle on the top of Mount Gilboa in 1 Samuel 31 when he begged his armor bearer to draw his sword and thrust him through. Remember that story? He had wasted his call and he showed no sign of calling on God with his dying breath, only the need to get relief in his flesh still. And what about the last words spoken of by the wife of Phineas? The daughter-in-law to the high priest Eli, her dying words declared the tragic spiritual condition of the people of Israel as she spoke to name her son Ichabod, meaning the glory had departed. Dying words are not always good words. I found a note this week that I had jotted down years ago while attending another church where a pastor was doing a pastor appreciation service. And finding that note after years, years ago confirmed the direction of this lesson, the Sunday school teacher there shared a story of a lost man who attended several revival meetings but never gave his heart to the Lord. Just a few short weeks later, this man who would not give his heart to the Lord in revival found himself on his deathbed. He called for the woman who had preached the meetings. He begged for her to, play, to pray with him, and she did, but he was unable to find a place of repentance. His final words were, my feet are burning, my legs are burning. I looked up and found the dying words of several famous people and found some of them to be heartbreakingly tragic. 
Joan Crawford, a famous actress back in the 40s and 50s. Some of you may know her, some of you may not. She went out into eternity on May, in May of 1977 with these words, Don't you dare ask God to help me. Jack Daniel, whose legacy needs no elaboration, closed his eyes in death in October of 1911, his final words telling the story of his entire life's work and his final destination. One last drink, please. The first portion uh, of this book of Deuteronomy, it shares, we've already talked about it, it shares the words of Moses. The last, the final words, and I know he's not on his deathbed, but these are his final moments. These are the things he needs to instill and pour into this next generation. Amen? Get to my right place here. I got all jumbled up. All right. In studying some of the last words of Moses, Israel's great leader and deliverer, we find important truths for us today. Now, I don't know about you, but he's speaking to them in his final moments, but he's speaking to us as well, right? The Holy Ghost using these words, living book, still, still very prominent and pertinent to us. Don't we want to hear what Moses had to say before he left this world? Don't we want to take heed to what he's instructing them? And ultimately, God is instructing us through him centuries and centuries later. Um, let's find my place. Sorry. Some of this is going to be restated. When the book of Deuteronomy opens, Israel's on the thres threshold of the promised land again. After the great deliverance from Egypt through the Red Sea, known as the Exodus, and the great disobedience at Kadesh, which resulted in 40 years of wanderings in the wilderness, they are brought again to the border of Canaan, this time by the River Jordan. Now in Deuteronomy 3, this is just prior to this, of course, Deuteronomy 3, Moses tells of his pleading prayer to God that he might be allowed to go into the promised land. God forbade it, we know that, but allowed Moses to go up to the top of Mount Pisgah to view the land. And in chapter 4, Moses begins what we call and what this lesson is called his final address to Israel. Again, it's not exactly a deathbed situation, but final moments to pour in and final days for them to soak in what he had to say. Um, the first was for them to listen. Verse 1, if you look at it, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Too many people want to assume what God means or how or who God is without ever listening to what he has to say. In this we show, or they show, hopefully not us, but they show true spiritual ignorance and their blinded state. I have heard it many times myself as you have out there in the world out of the mouths of people who live contrary to his word. They, they don't live for God but they make statements of who God is and what his word says, and they talk as if they know God when their lives distinctly display unrighteous fruit and unholy practices. First, we have to listen. That is the, the given, and that's where he started. Now, therefore, hearken. And sometimes that's the hardest place, and some people never get past this. It's sad. I don't, this is, this is Christianity 101, Let's get it. Listen. Now, therefore, listen, Israel. Give your ear to me. I'm going to share you what you need to do to live and to make it and to serve God. Listen. Um, then verse 2 tells us that we do not add to what is said. We don't put our own spin on it. Okay. Let me read this. This is kind of jumping ahead, and I think the way that your book is designed, but I wanted to kind of go in order with the verses. Verse 2, where it says, You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. If we add to it, we're obviously not going to keep the right thing. If we take away from it, we're not going to keep the right thing. So it is what it is. We take it as it is, and our lives are to be adjusted, are to be sanctified, and to live in his word, not outside of it and not to add to it. 
In the light of the great privilege we have received and that we have God's word, we are reminded of our responsibilities. Do not change his words. Israel and we as well are told that we are not to add or take away from God's words. We have not been given the authority to add commandments to God's word. Neither have we be given, have been given the authority to take away of God's commands out of his word. If you and I will live it like it's written, we should have no trouble getting into heaven. Amen? Um, we are witnessing in our day and time a terrible lack of reverence for God's word. Many adding to and taking from on a constant basis. That's why it's so important. And I think it's part, it might be in something you read. I know it's in mine to read the Bible through. If you are a Christian and you have not read the Bible through, I cannot stress to you how important that is. We give our time to so many things. And sometimes necessities, things of life. But we give our time and our attention to a lot of things, don't we? We do. God's word has to have preeminence. It has to be first. And if we have not read the Bible through, we, we've been serving the Lord years and years. I don't understand that. We, that needs to be changed. That needs to be a goal. Some of it is hard to understand, but that's why you get out commentaries. That's why you read the Bible. That's why you ask questions. You ask of the Lord. I pray often to give me understanding of his word. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. That's a scripture in Psalm. Open thou mine eyes that I may see wondrous things out of thy law. Help me to see it, Lord. Uh, and that's what we've got to do continually to study it, to read it, to memorize it, keep it. Because if we don't, someone will try to alter it in our hearing and we'll go along with it. We see it all the time. We've got to keep it in our hearts. Um, I want to share this with you. Um, after the King James Version came out in 1611, 1611, King James Version came out, over 200 years passed without anyone feeling that they had been cheated out of the true word of God. So that lasted for about 200 years. They kept, that was their version in English. Uh, in the 1800s, there were those who said that better or more accurate manuscripts had been found, and therefore we needed a new translation of the Bible because the one we had was no longer adequate. That was back in the 1800s now. The revised version was only the first such improvements that the world had been subjected to. Since that time, scores of versions and translations have come out, each claiming to be more accurate than the preceding ones, easy to read, those sort of things that they come out with. And then this, of course, is from the teacher's version. I don't think it's in yours. But we contend that the King James Version is based on the most acceptable Greek text and needs no revision. We contend that it's the most accurate and reliable version available today and that it does not need to be added to or subtracted from. Amen? We refuse to accept new versions in which the deity of Christ is diluted or removed. We refuse to believe new versions which undermine the virgin birth or the power of the blood of Jesus, and there are those that do that. By the same token, just as the warning in Deuteronomy about adding to or taking from God word, God's word applies in the matter of versions, it also applies in the matter of life. We must be careful not to add to or take away from God's word his requirements for holy living and anything else he requires of us. Tampering with God's word is a serious matter and must be avoided. This is one of the, after Moses says, listen to me, the first thing you need to do is not to add to or take away from what God says. That's what verse 2 is out of his address. Verse 3, he goes on and he says, Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that follow Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. Now that is simply referencing something that happened, took place in Numbers 25. And it's also referenced in Psalm 106. Um, verse 3 makes reference to seeing what happens when men and women do not follow God but follow other gods instead. So we've listened, we're not taken from it, and this is what's going to happen if you don't follow it, is, our, is his next step. Um, Psalm 106, 28 through 30 speaks of this incident that Moses is speaking about here, which took place during the wilderness wanderings and is told in detail in Numbers 25. So when you get a minute, um, please read Numbers 25. It's a familiar story. This is where Zimri brought in a Moabite woman among them. 
and I believe he was slain. Some of the Israelites yoked themselves and joined to the, the Baal of Peor, which just means Baal was any kind of false god. It was Baal, the Lord of this, the Lord of that. There's many different Baals out there. Baal of Peor, and this Peor just means the, the opening. Baal of Peor, and this stirred the Lord's anger, and a plague broke out among them. 24,000 of them perished during this plague. Now Moses is calling to rem their remembrance this. He's saying, remember what happened at Baal Peor when people didn't follow the Lord. It was only through the interve intervention of the priest at that time, Phineas, who was zealous for the Lord, that the plague was stayed. And here in Deuteronomy 4 and 3, Moses, in his final address, his final teaching, calls to their remembrance what happened to those who did not follow the Lord. Now, I don't need incentive, I want incentive, the blessings of the Lord, but also sometimes the incentive to stay with God is to, to look at other people's lives, those that don't. Isn't it? When you, when you see what happens to other people who decide that I'm just not going to follow him, it's too hard, or whatever their excuse is, something happens and they just want their flesh more than they want the Lord and they go their own way. I mean, I have enough incentive to serve the Lord because of who he is. But when I look at sometimes what happened to other people, man, I don't want to leave the Lord <laughs> just for the simple reason of what happens to other people. I've seen it. And that's what Moses is telling them. Look at what happened to those that chose to not follow God, those that at, Be at Bel Peor, those 24,000 of them perished because they didn't choose to follow God. Remember that as well. I don't have to go into all the details of what has happened to those who have chosen to walk away from God just in this church alone. I don't have to call their names, but you can just briefly call to your mind the horrible outcomes of those who have wasted the truth given to them on alternative lifestyles, addictions, and even criminal activities. Some have even died as a result, while others are surely closer than they realize to the same fate. It is a hard but very real truth. If we choose other gods before the true God, there will be a price to pay. And that's what Moses is saying here in verse 3. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of this, this, the Lord of the opening. For all the men that followed them, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. There is a side to God that I don't ever want to be subject to. I serve him, I love him, and I have given my life to him. Amen. I believe you believe the same and are there too. I don't want to see the side of his judgment. I plan to be out of here. Amen. Not just in the rapture, but in this life as judgment is poured out, which I believe it's already begun. I want to be in the, the light, don't you? And not in the dark receiving that uh, judgment. We are getting over time here. Uh, last, we'll just go, but ye that did cleave unto the Lord, this is verse 4, but ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive every one of you this day. Life is associated with cleaving to God. I want life here, and I want life over there. Amen? The words of Moses we should take heed to. We didn't get done, but I'm not surprised, are you? I always have a lot to say. I believe the Lord. There's so much in God's words, such a depth here. Um, I just love him. Y'all continue to pray for the Sunday school as we travel this path together. Lord will use us and everybody will be blessed and helped and strengthened. Uh, we'll just continue on. Uh, if we pick up some of that next week, we'll just see. But if you go ahead and read the next lesson, uh, I do hope you got something out of this lesson. Uh, looking forward to what the Lord's going to do in the service. Let's have church together. Love y'all. As the shadows of the moon gave way to morning once again, emerging from beneath its dark disguise. And as the clouds were sailing by, I watched the seagulls swirl and fly. It was as if your mighty hand were painting art across the sky. A miracle. Oh, I marvel at the wonders only you can realize. 
Such perfection in your touch for your creations are divine. A universe of endless mystery. Oh, when I contemplate your genius, it just draws me to my knees. South Africa Church of God. It's so good to see you in God's house today. Good to have Brother Benny back, Sister Sarah back. Good to have Donna back. All the ones that's been out, we're just glad to have you back today. Praise God. Uh, you know, I, I'm glad everybody's here today. Those watching online, I want you to just let the Lord have his liberty in your lives today. Let go and let God. Let's stand and go to the Lord as we open up the service. Precious Heavenly Father, we just thank you, we praise you, Lord God, for your goodness, your mercy, and love. We thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity to be in your house today, Lord God. I thank you, Lord, for every blessing you bestowed upon us, Lord God. Lord, it is a blessing that we're able to get out this morning, Lord God. Get up, Lord God, be able to get ready and come to your house today. And now, Lord, help us to receive what you've got in store for us this day, Lord God. Lord, ask God you to minister to every aspect of the service, Lord God. Lord, ask God you to bless the song, Lord God, bless the offer, Lord God, bless the blessing. Sunday school lesson this morning, you know, we need to know, make sure we're, not only we're listening to what God's speaking to us, but we teach it to our children and to our grandchildren. We had that wonderful lesson this morning. 
You know, Acts 2 and 1 says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Are we here today in one accord in one place? If we are, then we can expect and said, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Let's pray for that suddenly moment today. I know Wednesday night, Brother Eddie up here trying to take the offering, pray over the offering, and he had that suddenly moment. The, the Lord just blessed him. We can have it if we'll present our bodies as a living sacrifice. We can receive those blessings. Praise God. Let's continue to worship as we get the choir coming this time. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah.
God. Praise Aren't you glad this is not Praise our end? Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad we don't have to stay here forever? But after a while, it's all going to be over. We're going to be with Jesus in heaven. Praise God. Hallelujah. After a while. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's uh, continue worshiping and giving to get our ushers to come receive the tithe and offering. Also, after we receive the tithe and offering, we're going to come back and receive the widow's offering. Today is widow's offering Sunday. Praise God. Hallelujah. Brother Zach, would you pray over this time of worship? Bless you for your faithfulness and giving. Just bless my heart to look back and see a man back there just praising God, clapping her hands and worshiping the Lord. Right. Praise God. Uh, we'll have our $2 drawing now. Uh, got one there, brother. Also, it's time to do our birthdays uh, and anniversaries. Our birthdays, I think we've got a couple of birthdays. Uh, Sister Chastity and uh, Sister Audrey. Uh, Sister Audrey had a birthday yesterday, and Sister Chastity had a birthday Wednesday. Uh, so right. y'all stand, come up, and we'll, we'll stand and sing happy birthday to them. Make come, up come on up to the front. Make yeah, up. praise <laughs> God. We could make you come and sing it yourself. Come, come with us. Mm -hmm. All right, stand Amen. there with me. All right, let's sing happy birthday to him. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Anniversary since last Sunday, Brother Branson. I know your wife's not here with you, but let's sing Happy Birthday to Brother Branson and Sister Andrea. And for anniversary, <laughs> get me straight out here. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary. God bless you. Happy anniversary. Uh, you know, when we 
I had the two dollar drawing a while ago. I didn't know if it was gonna get a name or not. Brother Patrick said he put his name in there. He said he'd he'd take the two dollars. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, also, announcement: We need some men to stay after service today to change the water filter over in the uh, pump house. So if we can get some men to stay around and help do that. Uh, also, remember our pastor's Christmas gift. Uh, this time's getting away from us, so we need it. Uh, be turning these, be turning these in special gift for our pastor for Christmas. Also, for our sign-up sheet for the youth night in the vestibule, sign up for in, in uh, 2023 for a night. Invest in our youth. Let's take some time and spend some time with them. Okay, praise God. Uh, prayer request, we've got a lot to pray about. Uh, let's continue praying for Brother Scott. He's still sick in his body. And pray for little Lily. I, mean, you know, I know she's with him today, so pray for her. Also, pray for uh, little Oliver. He's still sick in his body. And just God will touch him and heal him. Uh, also, pray. For, continue praying for Sister Sandra. We're believing that God's going to completely heal her body. Continue to pray for Brother and Sister Ball. God will touch them. Pray for uh, Sister Sarah Stillman. I know she's back today, but I'm sure she's probably weak in her body after going through that illness. So pray for her. Uh, continue praying for Brother uh, Key Speed and also for Sister uh, Pastor Key's wife, Sister Key, for their healing. Pray for Sister Garrett. She said she's having some pain in her right side. Let's pray for her today. Also pray for Sister Blanche. She says she needs a touch in her body today. Also, Sister Sharon, she wants to be anointed for an individual that God knows all about. So get her to come up, and uh, we'll stand. We'll go to the Lord in prayer for these needs. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Leaning on Jesus, I'm leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all.
Amen. Raise your hands up and praise God and thank Him this morning. He's touching people in these orders right now. Thank God for it. your hands up and praise the Lord this morning. Praise the Lord. Let's give him praise out loud. It's all right. Praise Amen. Praise his name. 
Praise God. Praise the Holy Ghost is in this house touching people Praise today and helping people in this house this morning. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. He knows what we need when we need it. He's an old yes. time God. Oh, yes, he yes. is. Oh, yes. Praise the Lord. I appreciate the way that you respond when it's your brother or your sister in need of prayer. Because you never know when you're going to be on the other side of that thing. When you're going to be the one in need of prayer. Amen. I appreciate you praying with these this morning. That means you care about each other. You love one another. You don't want to see anybody sick. You don't want to see people going through hard things. You want to see God help them. That's why we pray. We pray not to be seen. We pray that God will hear us and God will move. I appreciate the way you prayed for your brothers and sisters around these altars today. Amen. Give God a good hand of praise this morning. What a joy it is to be in the house of God. Hallelujah. I'm glad for God's goodness, aren't you? How many of God's already touched you? Amen. It's a joy to be in church. It's good. As Peter said, it's good for us to be here. There on that Mount of Transfiguration, he saw the Lord there clothed in white. His glory, the cloud of God, came down there. And Peter said, it's good for us to be here. It's good for us to be in the presence of God. Nobody can make it outside of his presence. We need his touch. This is not just a Sunday morning thing and then I'm okay throughout the rest of the week. I need his touch every day of my life. How about you? There's a lot of things that I can make it without. A lot of things that I could just say I don't have to have that anymore. But nobody can make it without the touch of God every single day in their life. The Bible said it's in him that we live and move and have our being. I'm glad for his touch this morning. Amen. Wednesday night I got home and uh, after service and wound down and get ready for bed and spent my time in prayer. And God spoke to me there that I was going to be preaching on hell this morning. And I got up early. Thursday morning I was up here about 7.15. I told Sister Shelton I had, I had something burning in my heart. And uh, I've let you shout and let you do all that. But we've got to preach today for a little while here. And I've uh, been carrying this all week since Wednesday night. And I'm not going to leave here without preaching this message if God will be our help. Amen. If you have your Bibles, Mark chapter 9. And we're going to begin reading in verse 43. Dylan, good to see you back there, son. We've claimed him. All of you, we love you. Appreciate you, good folks. All of you, we're glad you're in the house of God today. This is a joy to come here. I don't want anybody to come in this church and not feel like they're wanted here, that they're not loved here. Good to see Sister Sarah back. We missed her. and glad she's feeling better. Been praying earnestly for her and for her healing and God's helping us. Amen. Keep praying for our family. They're still dealing with some sickness right now, but God's touching them daily and helping them. And uh, we're just trusting his hand. Amen. Mark chapter 9 this morning, and we'll begin reading in verse 43. We want to pray. Let's go to God in prayer. I want to ask the Lord to clear our minds right now. Forget about everything that's going on before this time and what's going to go on tomorrow, next week, next month, what you're going to do after service. I want our hearts and minds to be in tune with the word of God today. I've asked the Lord, don't let any spirits, foul spirits, come and steal this seed from any heart this morning. Let that seed find the place it's supposed to go. Let it be deposited there by the Spirit of God. And let it bring life in this house this morning. Father, we stand here humbly today, God. Lord, I have a heavy heart. I know the task this morning, God. I'm asking you, Lord, that you'll just touch us for the next little while. Let me preach what you've impressed upon our heart to say, God. I know that there are people in this house, you know who they are, where they're sitting, that need this message today. I know there are people watching online right now 
that need this message today, God. And I pray, Lord, that you let this, this word of God find its mark this morning. Don't let one person leave this service lost. Don't let one person leave this service on their way to hell. Continue in that path. I pray, God, don't let one person watching online this morning at the close of this service turn it off and continue in a, a lifestyle of sin. I pray today would be the day of salvation. Father, we're honored and humbled to be here and thankful again to be behind this sacred desk. Help us now. Help this congregation. And we'll praise you for it all in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Mark chapter 9, verse 43 and reading. Mark said here, And if thy hand offend thee, that means if your hand makes you sin. If it makes you sin, cut it off. Separate from it. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, if your foot causes you to sin, if the path that you're walking causes you to sin, he said, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. He's not repeating himself here just to be repeating himself. He's trying to make a point. This fire is never going to go out for those who die and go to hell. Verse 46, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, if it makes you sin, pluck it out, separate from it. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. You may be seated for a little while this morning. Three times here in our scriptures that I've read here in verse 43 and again in verse 45 and then again in verse 47, Jesus refers to entering into life. That's what I want to preach to you about this morning. That thought, enter into life. Enter into life. In our modern day, many people not just in that secular world, but even inside the church, many people have rejected the notion of hell altogether. Matter of fact, it's not a subject that people sitting on pews want to hear a preacher talk about very often. It's not something you want to hear talked about at a youth service or a youth rally. It's not a service subject we want to hear talked about when the teacher's up teaching in the class. People, for the most part, have rejected the notion that there is a real eternal hell. But Jesus, in the Word of God, warns us again and again about this place. Matter of fact, if you read in the Gospels, you find that Jesus spoke only one time about heaven in detail, and he spoke concerning hell 11 different times. The Bible's clear to us, God's Word teaches us uh, that there is a literal place called hell. The Bible said in Psalms 9 and 17, the wicked uh, shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. When I read that verse, it burdens me for you, the, the United States of America. We are forgetting God in this nation. It also burdens me for every lost person in this nation. We are forgetting God as individuals. The Bible said in Luke 12 and 5, But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him, that is God, which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Luke chapter 16, verse 22 through 23. The Bible said, And it came to pass that the beggar died 
and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And the Bible said, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. The Bible teaches us that hell is a literal place. It also teaches us who's going to be in that place called hell. Psalms 9 and 17 that I've already shared with you tells us uh, that the wicked will be turned into hell. The Bible tells us that everyone who rejects the gospel message uh, that proclaims Jesus Christ as the only Savior uh, of the soul will go to hell. John 8 and 24, Jesus said, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, uh, ye shall die in your sins. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, In flaming fire take vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction uh, from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. I'm telling you here this morning, the Bible holds no punches. The Bible is clear and the Bible is emphatic and tells us that every person that does not know God Every person that does not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, every person who has not been born again, who has not been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, every person who does not serve the Lord by faith is heading for hell. That is their destination. That is the road. That is the path that they're on even right now. The Bible said they will be punished uh, with everlasting destruction. That means religious people, moral people, decent people, friends, relatives, family members, children, husbands, wives, grandchildren, sons and daughters, every person, every individual uh, who has not repented of their sins, who has not accepted Jesus Christ into their life uh, as Savior and Lord of their life, uh, they are heading for destruction uh, and the torment of hell. I don't know about you, friend, uh, amen, but that causes me uh, to want to make my calling and election sure. I want to make sure that I'm on the right path. I want to make sure that my name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I want to make sure I'm not just a Sunday saint and a Monday ain't. I want to make sure that I'm sold out. I'm surrendered unto him. I want to make sure that I love him with all my heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. I want to make sure that I'm right with God. Listen to me, friend. We're talking about eternity here. We're talking about the eternal soul. Every one of us are going to live forever. You're not going to die. You're going to die. This old body is going to go back to the dust, but your soul is going to live on forever and forever. And what you and I do with Jesus will determine where I spend my eternity. If I'll accept him into my heart and soul, he'll forgive me of my sins. And if I'll walk with him, I have a promise of an eternal home in heaven. But if I reject the gospel message, somebody said, Brother Shelton, we ought not to preach like that today. To that I cry foul. We ought to have more preaching and teaching on hell because hell is a real place and it is forever and forever. Ah, blessed God. Hell is a reality. People have already dropped off into that place. While we've been here this morning, there is no coming back. There is no return from that place. The Bible is clear to us. It tells us the truth that hell is a reality. 
and every lost person will lift up their eyes in that place. It's not that that sinner is going to be lost someday. If you're a sinner, you're lost right now. You are lost today. The Bible said you are dead in your sins. You are dead in your trespasses. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 3. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, uh, even as others. If you're a sinner, you're not waiting to be lost. Uh, you are lost right now. Not only are you lost today, but the wrath of God abides on you even right now. The Bible said in John 3 and 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3 and 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I'm telling you here this morning, every sinner uh, already has their ticket to hell. Uh, the ticket's already been punched. Uh, all you're waiting on uh, is to draw your final breath. Uh, and when you draw your final breath, uh, in hell you will lift up your eyes. You listen to me here this morning. Uh, amen. Right now we have the grace of God. Right now we have the mercy of God. Right now we know the love of God. It is not God's will that any should perish, but that all, that means you, every person should come to repentance. But those that reject Jesus, those that reject the mercy of God, the grace of God, the love of God, the moment your heart beats the last time, the last time your love lungs releases uh, that oxygen uh, and your soul leaves your body uh, in hell you're going to lift up your eyes in torment uh, and no matter how much you plead uh, no matter how much you pray uh, no matter how much you cry you cannot escape that awful place uh, I'm just telling you here this morning uh, if you're a sinner uh, you don't need to wait till next Sunday uh, you don't need to wait till you get older uh, you don't need to wait till a convention your time. Today is the day of your salvation. If you hear his voice, harden not your heart against him. Raise up your hands and praise him and love him today. Uh, dear God, do help me here this morning. You are lost now. You're not waiting to be lost. You have your ticket to hell. It's already been punched. The only thing that's going to save you now is giving your life to Jesus Christ. That is the only hope you have. You say that sounds so simplistic, but it is that simplistic. Simply come into Jesus, surrendering your heart and life to him, repenting of all of your sins, getting it all under the blood. Somebody said, how will I know if I really get saved? If you really get saved, there's going to be a change in your life. There's going to be a transformation in your life. There's going to be an about face in your life. When Jesus Christ comes in, he doesn't just patch, patch up a few places in our life. The Bible says he'll make a new creature, a new creation out of us. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. And and behold, all things are become new. 
I've been preaching a long time now. I've been preaching this gospel message for a lot of years. I want to tell you, friend, we are closer now today than we've ever been to eternity. I'm one day closer to death. You're one day closer to death. I've got to make sure when God says that my life is over here on this earth, i got to make sure I'm washed by the blood. I'm redeemed and I'm ready to meet Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen today. You have your ticket to hell. You're not waiting to get it. You're holding on to it right now if you're a sinner. The only hope you have is Jesus. The Bible said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but should have everlasting life. The Amplified Bible says of that verse, For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten, his unique son, so that whoever believes in, trusts in, clings to, relies on him, shall not perish. You'll not come to destruction. You'll not be lost, uh, but have eternal, everlasting life. I'm telling you, it has to be more uh, than just repeating after a preacher in an altar. Uh, it's got to be more than just saying, I believe. Uh, the devils believe and tremble, uh, but you've got to trust in him. Uh, you've got to cling to him. Uh, you've got to rely on him. Uh, that simply means you've got to serve him now. Uh, you can't just say, I got saved uh, and keep living for the devil. Uh, when you come to Jesus, uh, you got to give him your whole life. Uh, you got to give him your whole heart and you got to serve him all the days of your life. There's hope. There is hope for you today if you're a sinner. There's hope for you today if you've got that ticket to hell. There is hope for you today if you're lost right here and right now. I'm here this morning preaching and I'm here this morning reaching trying to get to you trying to reach your heart this morning not here to try to make you mad not trying to run you away from the church I'm trying to reach out to you and sow that gospel seed and cast that gospel net that you might be caught that you might be rescued that you might be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ hell is forever I said hell is forever. You can't escape it. You can't get free from it. You got hope now. But if you die without Jesus, you'll live eternally without hope in him. You don't have to die lost. You don't have to go to hell. Every time I hear of somebody dying, whether it's somebody in Hollywood, somebody locally, Somebody in the newspaper obituary, I always think, wonder where they're saved. Wonder where they're at right now. Wonder if they're in hell. I wonder if they're in heaven. Amen. Nobody has to go to hell. Nobody has to die lost. You, you say, well, Brother Shelton, I, you know, I got time. I, I, you know, I got, I got plans right now. I, but the Bible said we're not promised of tomorrow. I, I'm not preaching something strange to you here. I, I'm not preaching in Chinese here. I, you can understand what I'm preaching. I, not one of us I, know if we're going to have another day on this earth. I, don't you presume upon the past mercies I, of God. I, God has given you life to this moment, I, but he's not obligated to give you one more breath or one more day on this earth. You better use the breath that God's given you right now in his mercy and his grace and you better use it to cry out to the Lord for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord they shall be saved. Hallelujah to God. There are people in this sanctuary this morning there are people that you're watching this service online right now that are lost and that are headed to that awful place called hell. You need to come to Jesus today. 
We're not trying to get confessions in an altar so we can put in our reports we had another one saved. No, no, we want lives snatched out of the flames of hell. I told the Lord recently in prayer, God, that's what we're preaching for. That's what we're working for. Help us, God, to snatch souls out of the flames of hell. People that are walking over hell on rotten boards. Uh, one misstep, uh, one step too many, uh, and they're going to be there. While you're here, you have hope. While you're here in this life, uh, you have a chance. Uh, while you're here in this service this morning, uh, you have an opportunity uh, to give your life to the Lord. How do you know that, Brother Shelton? Uh, because if God uh, was not willing to save you this morning, uh, he wouldn't have spoke this to me all Wednesday night. Uh, he wouldn't have dealt with me all week. Uh, to preach on this today uh, God still loves you uh, God still cares about you uh, God's calling for you to come to him uh, and give your life to him uh, and surrender your all and serve Jesus Christ some of you have been running long enough some of you have been putting it off long enough some of you have been playing around long enough some of you have been hiding long enough. Today is the day of your salvation. Jesus said, enter into life. Today's the day that God can make a change in you. Today's the day that God can save your soul. Woo! Today's the day that the Lord can forgive you and change you. You've been putting it off. You've been running. You've been hiding. You've been avoiding this day. But now this day is here. I said now this day is here. Now you have an opportunity. Now the golden scepter from the king of glory has been extended to you in mercy and grace. Today the door has been opened. And if you walk through it, you'll enter into life. You'll find everlasting life. The choice is up to you. I wish I could make every one of you that's lost come to Jesus but you gotta walk through that door you gotta reach out and take hold of him you gotta come before him you have to choose Jesus and if you choose Jesus you're gonna choose eternal life raise up your hands and honor God today hallelujah have blessings I feel such a fight against this message here this morning. Those walls in your heart that's gone up, those walls that you've erected to deflect from the Word of God, humble yourself. Humble yourself. And let the Lord come into your life. Humble yourself. Tell the devil, I'm not going to live for you anymore. I'm not serving you anymore. Look at what you've done to me. Look at the mess you've made of my life. Look at the mess you've made of my family. Look at the mess you've got me in because I've served you. But today I'm going to humble myself. And today I'm going to accept Jesus into my heart and into my life. And today I'm going to enter into life. Today I'm going to find that hope. Today I'm going to give myself to Jesus. The Bible says here in Mark chapter 9, I want you to notice here. Jesus refers to the hand, the foot, and the eye. These are our three problem areas when it comes to dealing with sin. Sin will send you to hell. You might escape this time, but he'll get you next time. You might have got by this time, but sin's going to get you somewhere down the road. You, you may go along and say everything's all right, but I'm telling you, friend, uh, that, that, that sin lies at the door. And if you continue in a sinful lifestyle, it's going to get you. That is the Word of God. Amen. The Bible said in Romans 6 and 23, for the wages of sin is death. You keep punching that sin clock. Uh, amen. You're going to reap the wages of it. There's going to be a price to pay. The wages of sin is death. 
The Bible said Jesus said, the hand, the foot, the eye, if they cause you to sin, I, he said separate from them. The hand refers to the things we do. The foot refers to the places we go. The eye refers to the things we see or the desires that we have. These three words describe all the areas where we as human are tempted to sin. John said in 1 John 2 and 15 through 16, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Jesus said, if the hand causes you to sin, if the foot causes you to sin, if the eye causes you to sin, uh, Jesus said we're to take drastic action here. Uh, he said you're to amputate that body part uh, so that we'll not give in to his desires uh, and die and go to hell. What Jesus is saying here, uh, it's better to cut away those things uh, and enter into life, uh, amen, where your soul uh, will live on forever. It's better to cut away those things that tempt us. It's better to separate from those things that cause us or tempt us to sin and to go to heaven than to give in to that temptation and sin and die and go to hell forever and forever. Jesus is not telling us here literally to cut your hand off, cut your foot off, pluck your eye out. He's not telling us to mutilate our bodies. Jesus is trying to make a point to us. He's trying to emphasize to us uh, the horrible nature of sin uh, and that sin will lead our souls to hell uh, and we'll be there for eternity. People can ignore it. People can puff up at it. People can deny it. People can mock it. But be sure that your sin will lead your eternal soul to hell forever and forever. Jesus here in his mercy and grace and love is telling us how we're to deal with our sins. What he's saying to us is this, is that when temptation of sin comes in our lives, it has to be dealt with immediately. It has to be dealt with harshly. It has to be dealt with ruthlessly consistently and decisively sin should never receive any ground in your life or in my life the Bible said the little foxes spoil the vine if you let a little sin in your life it'll turn into a spiritual cancer it'll eat you alive it'll destroy you and it'll lead your soul to hell if that relationship is leading you into temptation. If that relationship is leading you into sin, you need to sever that relationship. We're talking about a cost now. We're talking about a price that's got to be paid. If that relationship is causing you to sin against God, you've got to cut ties with that. You've got to sever that relationship. I know you ain't going to shout much with that. I'm telling you, you're better to go to heaven walking by yourself than to go to hell, amen, and have all the friends this world over. I said you're better off to walk with Jesus if you have to walk alone and go to heaven than to have all the friends, all the accolades, all the approval of this world and lose your soul and die and go to hell. That relationship is leading you into sin, the temptation of sin. You better save, sever that relationship. If that activity is leading you into temptation and sin, you better cut that out of your life immediately. Amen. That TV is leading you into temptation and sin. The Bible said, set no wicked thing before your eyes. You better turn that thing off. Get that TV out of your house. If that computer is causing you to wander on the sites you ought not to be on, you'd be better off to throw that computer in the trash can and never own another one. If that iPhone's tempting you to look at things and listen to things you ought not to look at and listen to, it'd be better off not to own a phone the rest of your life and to go to 
heaven. Come on and say amen to me. He's saying you got to cut ties. you got to sever with all those things that will lead you to hell. Say amen. It's better to cut away and to remove everything and everyone from our lives that leads us to sin and go to heaven than to hold on to those things and to hold on to those people that will lead us to hell. The cost for discipleship's high. There's a high price to pay if you'll follow Jesus. Oh, but the benefits of following him far outweighs the cost of following him. In the Jewish society of that day, the right eye, the right foot, the right hand represented a person's best and most precious faculties. In that day, the right eye spoke of one's best vision. The right foot spoke of one's best walk. The right hand spoke of one's best skills. This is what Jesus is telling us here today, that we must be willing to give up the most precious and the most valuable things that we have in effort to avoid a life of sin to avoid temptation, to avoid being led astray and ending up in hell. He said in Matthew 16 and 26, For what is it a man profited if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? This is what Jesus is warning us here. Jesus is warning us that nothing in this world, nobody in this world is so valuable that it's worth losing our eternal soul over and going to hell forever and forever. I'm telling you, friend, you can live without everything in this life except Jesus Christ. I said you can live without everything except the Son of God. Hallelujah to God. I'm preaching and reaching for you this morning. I'm trying to cast this gospel net to catch the lost because your time is running out. And Jesus uses the word hell here. He has a specific place in mind. He's talking about a place here that's unseen by mortals and inhabited by the unredeemed dead. As Jesus talks to that crowd that day about hell, he uses a place that the people could see there in that day. Things that they could see as an illustration of the place that they could not see. The word hell comes from the word Gehenna. Gehenna was a place in the valley of Enom near Jerusalem. In ancient times, it had been a site devoted to pagan worship. And it was here that the people of Israel had sacrificed their children to the false gods of the Canaanites. In the old economy, King Josiah, that godly king, he tore down those pagan orders that, that desecrated the site, turned it into a garbage dump. In Jesus' day, uh, Gehenna was a horrible place. It was a literal place in that day. And as he's speaking to that crowd, he's using that place as an illustration to show them an example of what hell's going to be like. The word hell here comes from that word Gehenna. Gehenna was a place where the fires burned continually. It was a garbage dump. Criminals were thrown there. Their dead bodies were thrown there in that dump when they died. Wild dogs would roam that dump feeding on the carcasses of animals and on the carcasses of those criminals. The insane, those with leprosy, and other outcasts lived there as well. Gehenna was a place that burned. The fire burned around the clock. There were lifeless bodies there. Insane people lived out there around there. So Jesus used that as an illustration to show them as an example of how horrible hell is going to be. It's going to be a place where the fire never goes out. You don't just die and go there and burn up. 
but you'll be there forever and forever in the torment of that flame. I'm just telling somebody in this house today, God loves you. God cares about you. He didn't create you for you to die lost. He wants to save your eternal soul. And today is your day. Today is your day to be saved. Come on and play softly, please. Wednesday night. Ah, blessed God. Wednesday night in my prayer time. I spoke to my heart and said, on Sunday morning, you're going to preach on hell. I'd ask the Lord, what do you want me to say on Sunday? After the service tonight, when I get home my prayer time, I'll be asking God, what do you want me to say the next time? He said, you're going to preach on hell on Sunday. There are going to be people in, the house, in that house of God, in my house that's lost but I'm going to save them if they'll come to me. You're going to preach on hell. There are going to be people there that's lost, but I'm going to save them if they'll come to me. Today is your day, sinner. Today is your day, backslider. Don't reject him. Don't puff up. Don't get mad. Don't get sad. Come to Jesus. And surrender your heart and your life to Him. Let God have the reins of your life and your heart. And serve Him. And live for Him. Before it's eternally too late. Everybody stand please. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Today you have the opportunity to enter into life. The Bible says that the righteous scarcely be saved. Now you can believe it or how you want to believe it, but I've read this book through many times. That's what I do. I study the Bible. That's my life. I study, I preach, I pray. That's what I do told you Wednesday night I don't have any hobbies I don't do anything else that's what I do I don't shop I don't play golf I don't hunt I don't do anything else I study and I pray and I read the Bible and I preach that's why I'm on this earth what I know is this you can't be halfway you can't be lukewarm can't just be religious, but you got to be born again and you got to serve the Lord. That's the requirement. You can't just play around with God. You just can't play around with sin. You can't just take it or leave it. We have one life. And some folks only one opportunity. And the Lord knocks on your heart. So forget about all the excuses. You've made enough of them to gag on. If you die and go to hell, you won't worry about those excuses anymore. You'll be praying through eternity. There's people who won't pray now. There's people who won't do that now. They won't call on God. But if you die lost, you're going to be praying and pleading with God forever only to find out He don't hear you. He will hear you here now. Very simple order call today. Saints, I want you to pray. 
I don't know what time when I've had to fight so hard to preach a message. But I believe it's found the place it was supposed to go. Matter of fact, I know that it has. You've heard the Word of God this morning. Now all you have to do is receive it. To receive it, you need to come down to these altars and accept Jesus into your heart and your life as your Savior and your Lord. These altars are open for you if you're a sinner. If you're watching online, you can't, you're not in this house this morning, you can make an altar right there. You can get on your knees. If you're lost, would you come to Jesus today? Preacher got up and preached a message and said, this may be my last message. I don't know. He died right after that and never got to preach another one. I may preach a thousand more messages. This today may be the last message I ever preach. I don't know. But what I do know is this. If this is my final message, what a message. Reaching for your soul reaching for you to be saved. Young person, elder, everybody in between, if you're lost, you need to be in these altars right now. You need to come to Jesus. been said that to go to hell you have to be an unbeliever but that there are no unbelievers there everybody there believes somebody said to me one time they said brother Shep we don't need that kind of preaching today people need hope people need to be lifted up people need to be encouraged I'm going to tell you something. Every person in hell would love to hear this message before they went there. How are you going to tell them about the riches of heaven until you teach them about how bad hell is? We won't preach enough law to get them to grace. Hell's a real place, but so is heaven. And you can be saved. Your life can be changed forever today. Would you come, please? Would you come, please? Would you come? If you're a sinner, if you're a backslider, if you're not ready for heaven, if you've grown lukewarm in your experience, if you're uncertain, if you're here this morning and you say, if I was to breathe my final breath now, I don't know if I'd go to heaven or not. You need to be in these altars to make sure everything's under the blood. So when it comes time for you and I to leave this world, if we go by the grave before that rapture takes place, we can say like Brother Morris, his grandmother, open up them gates. <laughs> open up those gates. You can die in the faith. And be ready to go to heaven. Oh, there's nothing better in this life than know you're ready for heaven. Nothing any better of greater value than your soul and to have the hope that I'm ready to go to heaven. Father, I stood here this morning behind this sacred desk and I preached exactly what you said say to me to preach. I haven't held anything back, Lord. I haven't cut any corners. preached your word today. I know that there are people under the sound of my voice that are lost. That desperately need you. That the hourglass of their life is running down. And I know that today is the day for them to be saved. 
I pray for them right now, God. I pray, Father, that you won't leave them alone. I pray, God, you'll take sleep from them. Snatch their appetite away. I pray that in their mind they can't think of anything else. I pray, God, that you'll put a hedge of thorns around them so when they turn this way, they'll be pricked. And when they turn this way, they'll be pricked. And when they run this direction, they'll be pricked and reminded continually of their condition. Their eyes will be opened. And they'll receive the light of your word. They'll enter into life. And that you will give them life and life more abundantly. I pray for these young people. God, there's some young people in this house today that's lost on their way to hell. And they don't have any fear of it. They don't see any danger in it. They feel as though they're invincible. They're young. They're going to live forever. But I pray, God, you'd move on them in such a manner. Lord, that all they can think about is eternity. How much they need to be saved. That they don't have to die lost and go to hell. I want you, if you're able, to come. And I want to pray for the lost in this house. There's some in this house not saved, not ready for heaven. I know you're here because I know what God said to preach. I want you to come pray for them today. There's some that's watched online that's not saved. There's some that's backsliders. I, you know, I, I've been pastoring a long time, and I, I am absolutely amazed at times. I've watched people down through the years backslide, get out of church, and I've had people tell me why they quit coming, why they wasn't going back to church, why they were not going to serve the Lord anymore. And I've said to myself more than one time, really, you're going to give up your eternity for that. You're going to give up your soul for something that, something like that. You're willing to throw your eternal soul away for something like this or something like that. God, help us to see the value of that eternal soul. Help us, God, to realize I know that the prince of the power of this world, the devil, has blinded their eyes. And the only way they can see God is you have to shine light upon them. And open their eyes that they might see. And their hearts that they might receive. There's lost people all over this world, God. Shut up.